Would you pray with me? Father, you're our rock and our strong tower. We run to you today and we cling to you for our strength, our health. Lord, be with us as we come into your presence today, ushered by Christ, our high priest, our high tower. Lord, we run to you today. Inhabit the praise of your people. And I pray that you are pleased with our worship. You deserve the highest, the greatest. You're worthy of all of our praise. We make much of Jesus Christ today. Lord, for our preacher, David Hanna, who's standing, I pray that you give him strength. And you go before him. You prepare our hearts, Lord. And I pray that you visit us in unique and unexpected ways. It's not just a normal Sunday anymore. That you are at work all around us. And we're so grateful. We trust you now. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome to worship at Brentwood today. So glad that you're here. And I'm going to encourage you to uh, take a look at your bulletin that you received when you came in this morning. And know that there are several ministry opportunities in there ready for you to get plugged in and begin serving. That information is there. And I, uh, I encourage you to make that your, this your lifeline, your your life guide as you journey through life here at Brimwood. This bulletin is uh, a place where you can find information. You can also visit our website, uh, brimwoodbaptist.com. I encourage you to go there at any time. Guess if you're with us this morning, if you'll look there on the chair back, the pew back right in front of you, you'll notice there's this communication card. If you'll take that out and begin to fill it out as I'm talking with you now, guess we want to have a record of your visit today. Let us know that you're with us and and uh, that we can make the connection with you and we want to, to help you on your journey get you plugged in if you allow us to do so and uh, if you'll fill it out in its entirety guest places in the offering plate as it comes by let that be your offering today would be so delighted to have that from you well at the conclusion of our service you're going to hear about something that's very important to us uh, David is going to tell you about our next steps and so I'm, I'm um, telling you about that now and uh, Perhaps you have, for one, all of us will have a decision to make. When the Lord reveals himself through his word, then we're faced with uh, a matter of obedience. All of us are. But for some of us, that step of obedience may be in believer's baptism, which we're about to witness together. And some of you may need to follow in that. Uh, some of you may need to follow in obedience in becoming members of Brentwood, and you want to know more about what it means to do that or, or make a profession of faith, perhaps for, for the very first time, or you come into relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to help you do that, and we want to continue the conversation of the message started today, and we have uh, counselors that are ready to receive you at our Next Steps banner. And so at the conclusion of our service, David's going to tell you, and he's going to encourage you to go to the Next Steps, which will be right out these doors and to the right. And so we ask that you make that uh, prayerful matter, and that you follow the Lord in obedience to that. Well, we have the uh, privilege of witnessing together the testimony of believers' baptism. So if you would, turn your attention to the screen. Well, good morning, church. Today we get the blessing of being a part of a baptism for brothers. Uh, so this morning we have Camden Jones, is 10. We have Jones Hall. Excuse me, I got that wrong. This is Camden Hall, and this is Jones' brother Hall. Jones is 7. And uh, so got the opportunity about four weeks ago, five weeks ago, to talk with them uh, about their decision. And uh, both of them did it with their parents. Camden did it about three years ago with his mom and a couple months ago decided, you know, this is the time for me to tell people that uh, I know Jesus. And so Camden, I wanna ask you this morning, have you asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. Awesome. Well, it's my honor and my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very light instead of his death, raised to walk in a new life. And this is Jones Hall, who is seven years old. And just like his brother, uh, driving down the road with his mom, pulled into the park, uh, the driveway at their house, and in their garage, they sat in the car and they talked through what it meant to be a Christian. And in that moment, he asked Jesus Christ to be his Lord and Savior. And so he wanted to come this morning with his brother to be able to tell you all what God has done in his life. And so, Jones, have you asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? Awesome. It's my honor and my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Prayed in the last of his death, raised to walk in a new life. Awesome. 
stand together now. Let's greet a guest and a neighbor. Tell them it's good to see them at Brentwood, and then we're going to continue to sing.
just long enough to do what Jesus did, to pull along and outside the flow of the routine and, and talk to our Father. We have at least two very important things to pray about this morning. The first is to be in prayer as a community of believers for David Hanna, who will be preaching today. Anytime anyone stands in this place and opens that book and speaks, he needs the prayers of God's people. And we want to pray for him today because this is a very sacred and holy moment when God speaks through his word and his sermon. So David will be here and we will gather around him and pray for him. But our hearts are also drawn into a time of prayer that's happening all over the country this morning. As Christians, brothers and sisters are coming together in prayer for those friends and brothers and sisters in Christ in the Houston area, recovering from the devastation of the hurricane that came through now days ago. While you and I are singing and giving and praying and listening today, some of them are tearing out sheetrock and looking for clothes and food and a whole army of people are there serving and still looking for people that need help. And we've been called together to pray today as brothers and sisters in Christ for both those that are serving and helping and those that are in need of help. It is our privilege to do so. We can't all go. We can't all pray. And so we will do that. So if, just for a few moments, right there where you are or at these steps, if God leads you to come here, as David comes, as we all still our hearts, let's pray together right now. Lord Jesus, we are humble before you today. We thank you for the declaration of the song that you are stronger, that you are able, that you are mighty, 
that you are king, sovereign. We give you our worship today. We give you our response of praise. We give you our offerings and our tithes. We give you, Lord, our very lives. We thank you for the promise of your presence in this place today. We pray for David, Lord, as he comes in just a few moments and opens your word. We ask, God, that you open our hearts and that we would hear your spirit speak as your servant presents your truth today. We pray for his congregation, Lord, at Lockman Springs. You'll bless that work. and Those people would be a light into that part of Nashville. And God, our hearts are Pull toward Texas today as we think about the devastation that many are facing this Sunday morning. We thank you for the army of people that have made their way there, that are serving even as we pray today. We ask you for strength and for resources to help them meet those needs as they are your hands and your feet. And God, we pray for those that are so affected by a storm we're reminded in times like this how powerless we really are and how awesome and powerful you are. We pray that even as people are digging out from the devastation and some even facing the loss of family members, God, we ask that your spirit would be on display through your church and to the world as your love and your mercy and your grace is made evident while you move during these days. And Lord, may the testimony be that your church represented you and extended your love and that men and women and boys and girls would even come to a knowledge of who you are by how powerfully your love and your grace is on display during these days of challenge. Now, as we continue to worship God, we ask you to use all of what is done here today to lift up the name of Jesus, high, the only name that we worship, so that we could all be drawn in closer to you for your glory. And in your name we pray.
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yes. Praise his holy name. He is worthy of all that we have to give to him. I come straight from Psalm 29. Did you know that? A commandment to praise the Lord. In this special moment, we have praised Him with our mouths. We've praised Him with our corporate worship together. But we get to praise Him with the offering, the giving. And you know, that's not just a number. The tithe does not just mean just a number. But it means priority. It means making the sacrifice of praise, the sacrifice of giving priority in our lives. That's when it becomes worship for us. And you know what? Sometimes that means a giving out of pain. It, it sometimes means giving out of uncertainty and being faithful and obedient even when we don't know what's around the corner. And we do so joyfully. And my prayer is that we are faithful. And the Lord says, thank you, faithful church. And then we say, Lord, we love you. And we want to show you that we do by our trust and faith. Would you bow with me? Our ushers are ready to receive our offering. And guests, you place your guest card in the offering plate. And this is a moment for us just to reflect on God's goodness and his or, and we just offer an offering of praise and thanks to Him. And so, Lord, we do that now. From all of our heart, Lord, we, we praise You with the gift. And, Lord, I pray that our giving is not normal, but it is priority. That it's of our first fruits, meaning that it is the best that we can possibly give you. Lord, I pray that we do so today out of generosity and love, but out of faithfulness and obedience to you and your call in our life. That it demonstrates to you that we mean what we say, that we love you and you're worthy of praise. And so I pray that our, our giving today demonstrates that. And Father, that you find us faithful. May this be true. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. A few years ago, when we started talking about the Lachlan Springs campus, we were challenged in how to find the perfect match for a pastor for that campus. It's an edgy part of town. It's a creative part of town. It's a transitioning part of town. It is a town that is not much like the Brentwood campus at all. It would have to be somebody very different. Well, in God's good timing, in God's good plan, he had been preparing somebody different for the Lockman Springs campus. David and Nicole Hanna have been in our church for years. They taught a Sunday school class. Then they had heard the call to missions and spent about 10, 11 years in Bologna, Italy, working there at the University of Bologna, where it is one of the most uh, postmodern centered campuses in all of the world. It was a perfect training ground for what they'll see in Lockman Springs and East Nashville. So, we brought David and Nicole to be part of our team a few months ago, and they've already hit the ground running. I know you'll be eager to hear the story of David and David and Nicole, and eager to hear the word that God will bring through him. Here's David. Good morning. Well, that was nice. You know, this is the third time I've gotten to see Daniel and that awesome bow tie. It's wooden. Did you guys notice that? I got an amen for a wooden bow tie. I got to see Daniel and his awesome wooden bow tie lead worship, and it has blown me away every single time, uh, both the worship and the bow tie. Um, and the hardest thing for me is to figure out how to follow it. Uh, as Mike told you in that video, my wife and I have been a part of Brentwood Baptist Church for a long, long time. I believe uh, we first started attending in 1996. God called us out of this congregation to go to the mission field in Italy. And in the intervening years, he taught us so much about him and so much about ourselves. 
And those lessons were based on a foundation that was laid at this church through the things that I heard, the things that I saw, the things that I learned as a part of Brentwood Baptist Church. And I'm forever grateful to be a part of this community. Years and years ago, as a part of Brentwood Baptist Church, I was actually blessed to be a part of the inaugural TNT leadership course that, uh, that they teach here. And for me, it was an unbelievable blessing because it was my first opportunity to, to really dive deeper uh, and get a higher level of theological training, uh, get to look at doctrine, spiritual leadership. It was just an incredible time of growth for me. And I will never forget one of the first things that they did in that course was they asked us to go home, choose one of the Gospels, and read it from beginning to end. You know, start chapter 1, verse 1, and go all the way through without stopping. Don't look at a commentary. Don't look at a concordance. Don't try to find the original Greek. Just read it. And I did that. And it's amazing when you do that. What starts to happen? You start to see kind of the in-between times in the story of Christ's life and Christ's ministry. You start to see what happens between the miracles and the parables and the healings and the confrontation with Pharisees and the sermons on the mount. You start to see the transitions between the two. And as you do that, these patterns, these rhythms of Jesus' life and Jesus' ministry begin to emerge. And it gives you an entirely new perspective on his life and ministry. Now, when they asked me to do that, I, not surprisingly, chose Mark, it being by far the shortest of the Gospels. And as I read through Mark, a couple of things started to stand out. First of all, Mark is very much so a no-nonsense gospel. He jumps right in. It is, it is an actions, speaks louder than words gospel. Bang, bang, bang from the beginning. And also, it, it, it's characterized by this style of kind of action and reaction. If you think about the author, Mark, as like a movie director, as something happens, as an action takes place, we, we zoom in on Jesus and we see Jesus and, and what he does and what he says and we see his heart, but then the camera will pull back out and kind of pan across the crowd and you get to see their reaction. And what begins to emerge as you read through Mark is the understanding that for Mark, the important things were not only Jesus' actions and Jesus' words, but it was the crowd's response to those actions and those words. Which leads us to the passage we're going to look at this morning, the first chapter of Mark. Now before I read this passage, let me confess to you that this is a tough one for me. This text has been difficult for me because I stand in front of you, chief among sinners, when it comes to forgetting and possibly even ignoring some of the things that we're going to talk about in this passage this morning. If you guys would turn with me to the first chapter of Mark, we're going to start in verse 35. Would you stand with me as we read God's word? Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up, went out, and made his way to a deserted place. And he was praying there. Simon and his companions went searching for him. They found him and said, everyone's looking for you. And he said to them, let's go on to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there too. This is why I've come. So he went into all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Dear Lord, we are grateful and amazed for your presence with us this morning. We are thankful for the opportunity to study your word. I ask that my nerves and my fallibility do not stand in the way of truth. Give us ears to hear and give us hearts to listen. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay. Mark chapter 1. 
Not surprisingly, we find ourselves right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. But Mark being Mark, things are already going hot and heavy. In these first 34 verses, we see Jesus getting baptized. He goes out into the wilderness for 40 days where he's being tempted. He resists all of these temptations. He uh, immediately comes back and begins proclaiming the gospel and speaking about the kingdom of God. He calls the disciples. Crowds are starting to come. Word of his ministry is spreading throughout Galilee. He's healing the sick. He's casting out demons. Immediately before these verses, he's at this house until late, late, late into the night. And crowds have come from everywhere. And it tells us that he, he heals all kinds of diseases that night. And he casts out demons that night. And then we come to kind of this anticlimactic four verses, this in-between stuff. You know, all this triumphant ministry and this big stuff is happening. And then, and then we have this kind of transition where we see Jesus and he, and he goes off and he prays. And then the disciples can't find him. And then they find him. And they're like, hey, dude, come on back because we've got all these people that are waiting on you. And Jesus looks at him and says, let's go to the next town. And then they go to the next town. And then the cycle starts back over. He's in the next town and he's preaching and he's healing and he's casting out demons. When we're studying the scriptures, when we're looking at the gospels, and when we're reading it for the sound bites, these are the things we miss. Yet for me, the humanity of Jesus, this is when it shows up. This man that I follow, this man that I profess to try and imitate, this is where his patterns and his rhythms begin to emerge. Now think about it just for a second. So Jesus, 100% man, 100% God, the 100% man part means that he would have felt and experienced all of the emotions, all of the feelings, all of the thoughts, all of the temptations that we all do. So here he finds himself at a very crucial time in his ministry. It's the very beginning of his ministry, and, and word is starting to spread, and crowds are starting to come, and, and no doubt he can sense that his ministry is about to be defined. I'm sure that he's excited. I mean, we're right at the beginning, and already crowds are coming. Already he's getting all of these opportunities to tell people about his Father's kingdoms. Already he's getting all these opportunities to heal people, to cast out demons, to do all of these things. I have no doubt that he's excited. At the same time, I have no doubt that he's stressed. You know, if we look at those verses before, again, late, late, late into the night, he's healing all kinds of diseases he's casting out demons this is no doubt times that are emotionally and spiritually exhausting and draining on top of that if we look at some of the other gospels immediately before this he was he was almost run out of town on a rail by a crowd of people who cornered him and wanted to throw him off a cliff so it's not all kind of cotton candies and rainbows for Jesus at this time. There's a lot of stuff going on. And then you've got the disciples, which are no doubt adding stress because they're telling him where they think he should go and who they think he should talk to. And they're, they're chasing him down when he's trying to find time alone. Uh, the, the, the language used in this passage would be the same language used for like a, a desperate manhunt. When it says they went out and looked for Jesus, they were on this desperate manhunt for Jesus. So all of these factors, all of this chaos swirling around him. And what does he do? He escapes to get off by himself and go be alone with his father. In the middle of all the stress and the chaos, it tells us that Jesus woke up so early in the morning. We can pinpoint it based on the language, probably between 3 and 4 a.m. after an exhausting night where his, his energy his emotions were in such demand. At this critical time in his ministry, his first reaction is to wake up before anybody else is up, before the sun even comes up, and go off and be by himself. The Gospels tell us that this is a consistent pattern that Jesus has. It shows us time and time and time again, Jesus making time to intentionally be alone with his Father. And yet this is something that we so often ignore. Studies have shown us that Christians today, the average Christian, has prayed about once in the last week. Which isn't 
isn't all that bad, I guess. Uh, those same studies show us that the average prayer lasts less than five minutes. The excuse most commonly given, not surprisingly, is that we're just too busy. There's just too much stuff to do. Now, I get it. Jesus, he could carve out hours and sometimes days to go into the wilderness, to go out on a boat, to go up to the top of a mountain and be alone with his father. But come on, 2017, can't do that anymore. There's just too much stuff going on. But the good news, Hannah, you're all thinking, is Paul tells us to pray without ceasing. And my Sunday school teacher a long time ago told me that what that means is that I have this ongoing conversation with God. And that's what I do. That's the way I live my life. That's the way I live my faith. I'm constantly talking to God. I don't have these big chunks of time, but, you know, in the mornings when I'm stuck in traffic or when I'm waiting in line at Target or after I put the kids to bed and before I do the dishes, I have these moments, right, that I can speak to God. I have this ongoing conversation. My wife and I, uh, we, we have ongoing conversation like that. Constant communication. It's, you know, all day long. It's, that's, the, that's, the way, that's the way we do it these days. It's international sign for text messaging, by the way. We have a text message thread that goes back years. But if you look back through those text messages, that constant communication that we have, the vast and overwhelming majority of those messages are, hey, baby, um, do you need me to stop at the grocery store and pick up anything on the way home? Who's going to get Ruby Love from ballet? This meeting's running late. I'm going to be home later than I expected. Constant communication and necessary communication, the nuts and bolts of the way life works, but it's logistics. And, and if our communication, if my communication with my wife was only that, I can abandon all hope of any deep, intimate relationship with my spouse. It would be the same story that we've heard time and time and time again of, of relationships and marriages that the first year or two, it's blissful and it's wonderful and it's dynamic and it's amazing. And then maybe there's a couple of kids or maybe there's a job and there's a promotion. And just in general, life happens. And we become two ships passing in the night. And we wake up 25 years later and look at each other and we're just roommates. Now, my wife and I know this. Sadly, we've seen this and we recognize it. So we are incredibly intentional about carving out time for just us. Carving out time to be together so that we can have that deep and intimate relationship. Yet, so many of us, so often myself included, relegate our relationship with the God of the universe, a heavenly father that wants to know us and be known by us to this constant, tiny text message conversation. Never spending intimate time with our father. In the chaos of the world, as everything swirls around us, when we're facing a massive amount of demand in our lives, that is the time when we need most desperately intimate, intentional alone time with God. You know, Martin Luther famously said one time, I have so many things to do today, I'm going to need to spend the first three hours in prayer so that I can get it all done. And it's a great quote, but it's so often that I react exactly the opposite from that. I am absolutely, it's my confession to you that I am absolutely ruled by the tyranny of the urgent. And I can spiritualize it. And I do. God, I know, I know that I need to get away. I need to spend some time with you. I need to really be intentional about it. But I've got to study for my sermon. And it's kind of a big deal, God. You know, there are these pastoral care issues that I have to deal with. And um, there are 
emails and phone calls that I have to respond to. I've got these meetings where we're casting vision for this new campus, and I've got budgets i got to fill out, and if I don't get them done right, then we're not going to be able to keep our lights on at the church. Um, and i got to get this stuff done, and I'll get to you when I get to you. What that tells God is that those, in my mind, are the important things. What I have discovered is that so often I'm finding my self-worth, I'm finding my value, I'm finding my importance in my calendar, in my productivity. And I know that about myself because I'm putting that in front of intimate time with a living Savior. Now, Jesus, we see in these verses, when he's stressed, when, when uh, he's exhausted, when he has the world and, and chaos spinning around him, the first thing he does is go find alone time with the Father. And what we see out of that alone time is that he comes out with a new, a new direction, a new purpose. If we look back at the scriptures, you have, you have the disciples coming to him, you know, in this desperate manhunt for him. And they say, when they find him, they say, come on, come on back. Everybody's looking for you, exclamation point. You see, I have no doubt that the disciples, Capernaum, where they are, they would have thought that that was the purpose. That's the reason. Ministry was going great. Everybody's coming out of the woodwork. They're helping so many people, and there are so many more people to help, Right? And on top of that, they're probably getting treated like rock stars. They're the entourage for the most popular man in town. And they don't understand why he's going away. Come on back. We got things to do, Jesus. And Jesus looks at them with just an unbelievable calm. And all he says is, let's go to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there too. This is why I have come. You can just see Jesus, and we don't have record of what his prayer is, but you can see Jesus going off to be by himself, exhausted, stressed, tired, excited, all of these thousands of emotions, and getting centered with his Father and having intimate, intentional time with him. And when he comes out, he has a clarity of purpose, a definition to his ministry. And he looks at the disciples and he says, yes, all of these people are here. We've helped some, and there are more, but we need to go to the next village and the next village and the next village so that I can proclaim the kingdom of my Father because that's why I've come. Not just for this, not just for these people, but for so many more. Now, if Jesus relied on the guidance of direction of his Father, is it not easy to say that it would be even more so important for us to do so? There's another thing we see as Jesus shows us this pattern throughout the scriptures, throughout the gospels of, of making time to be alone with his father, and that's that he gains a strength from his prayer time. And that strength comes from a submission to his father's will, which seems kind of counterintuitive. Strength through submission. But we see it over and over again. I have no doubt that in this prayer, at this time, at this point in his ministry, you know, as, as everybody's coming out in Capernaum, and he, there's so many things that he could do and so many people that he can help, he probably didn't expect God to say, all right, it's time to pull up stakes and go on to the next village. Don't even say bye. It's time to get out of there. And yet, he does it with a calm and a, and a, a clarity of purpose. We see it over and over again, most famously in the Garden of Gethsemane. If you guys remember, the Garden of Gethsemane, immediately before Jesus is to be arrested, he's, he's desperate. He's anguished. He brings his closest friends to this garden, and he tells them, you guys stay right here and pray for me, because it's about to go down, and it's going to get ugly, and I need you. And then he goes off to another place in the garden to be by himself. And he is so anguished in his prayers that he begins to sweat, and he begins to sweat blood. You think about it. How much emotion 
do you have to be overcome with to where your sweat becomes blood? Now, his buddies back on the other side, they can't even stay awake. Every time he goes back to talk to them, they're sound asleep. Jesus, meanwhile, is desperately begging his father if there is any way for this not to happen. If there is any way for this cup to pass from me, make it so. But then every time, what does he say? But not my will, but your will. Dr. Hayden Robinson says, where was it that Jesus sweat great drops of blood? It was not in Pilate's Hall, nor on his way to Golgotha. It was in the Garden of Gethsemane. There he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the only one who could save him from death. Jesus was terrified of what was coming down the pike. Remember, 100% God and 100% man, the same emotions. Put yourself in that place where you know what's coming. He was so overwhelmed and overcome, he was sweating drops of blood. Yet he says, not my will but yours. And when he submits himself to his will, when the trials and the tests come, when he's arrested... And when he's tried, and when he's tortured, and when he's executed, we see a superhuman calm and composure. We see a strength that comes only from submission to his father's will. This man that was so overcome, he was sweating blood. Next thing you know, he can look the executioner in the eye with a calm and a composure out of submission. Now, his buddies that were asleep, they're the ones... They're not getting nailed to a cross. They're not getting thorns stuck in their head. They're not getting whipped, but they're the ones that are falling apart. They're the ones that are so terrified through all this. They're running from 13-year-old girls. But our Savior, he's the one that has this strength that comes from submission. Have you ever felt called by God to something that you just can't do? Have you ever felt in your heart of hearts that the Lord is asking you to do something and you just don't see a path forward? It's not going to work. You can't figure it out. You don't have the capacity to do it. You don't have the bandwidth to do it. It's only through intentional time with your Heavenly Father, through intimate relationship with your Heavenly Father and through submission to His will that we find the strength to put our right foot in front of our left foot in that path that God has laid before us. Now, we've all been on airplanes, and we've all seen the flight attendants, and and when they do the stuff, and they have the life thing, and they blow on the whatever, and and the oxygen mask comes down. None of us pay attention to any of it, because they're sky mall, Um, and we've heard it all before. <clears throat> but but the, the one thing I always remember is when the oxygen mask comes down, what, what do they tell you? You put yours on first, right? Right. You, so the oxygen mask comes down. If they, 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 they look at you and they say, if everything's going wrong and you see these yellow oxygen masks come down, put yours on first. And what I always hear them say is, in my mind, don't be a hero. If things are going wrong, don't be a hero. That's not what they're saying. What they're saying is be a hero. If things are going wrong, make sure that you are healthy enough to take care of the people that cannot take care of themselves. That's what this is. That's what Jesus modeled for us. When everything's going crazy around you and when you think all you can do is the next thing on your agenda... What Jesus has modeled is, no, take time to take care of your relationship with your Heavenly Father. And it's out of that 
that you will have the overflow to serve and take care of those around you. Now, if you remember, Mark is a gospel of action and response. And this morning, we've had, an, we've had an opportunity for the camera to zoom in a little bit on Jesus in just these four little verses and to really see how he reacts when he's stressed and when he's exhausted and when he's overworked. And he takes this time to go off by himself, to be alone with the Father, to be intentional with the Father, to take hours waking up in the middle of the night. And it gives him clarity. It gives him purpose. It gives him strength. All of these things. Now's the time that the camera pulls back and begins to look at our response. Guys, if you have questions, if you want to talk about any of this, we've got friends that are right outside those doors. Standing by a banner that says next steps. I am begging you, find them. Go talk to them. Would you all pray with me? Father God, we come to you this morning fallen and broken, laid bare. I confess to you all of the times that I've worshipped my calendar. I confess to you all of the times that I've been ruled by the tyranny of the urgent. And this morning we ask you to fill us with a desperate desire to be with you, to know you and to be known by you to be filled to overflowing with the fullness of your love. In your name we pray. Amen. And you are stronger, you are stronger, sin is broken, you have saved. Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of all. Jesus, you are Lord of all. Jesus, you are Lord of all. Thank you for being here today, and I hope you'll take your next steps right out of these doors and to your right. God bless you as you go.